Welcome everybody. We'll give everybody a, a minute or two to uh, file in. It looks like I can see the, the numbers going up. So we'll just give folks a minute as you arrive, but thank you for coming. We'll go ahead and get started. Habe, dahe, hudadoi, jaji, abri, tijo, washtake, nikashi, abri. My name is Jean Dennison, and I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation and also an associate professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington. I also get to co direct the Center for uh, American Indian and Indigenous Studies, uh, which is one of our co sponsors for this event, as well as the Simpson Center and the Department of American Indian. Uh, studies. Uh, so we want to begin by recognizing that the University of Washington stands and that I live on the lands and waters of the Lushootseed speaking people, specifically the Duwamish, the Muckleshoot, the Suquamish, the Tulalip, and the Puyallup. Um, we are here um, and are really committed to creating space for these and other Indigenous peoples through our mentorship, our teaching, our research, and our service. And of course, um, today's event um, is really um, grounded in, in, in these commitments. And so it will be, um, this is certainly far from um, a hollow land acknowledgement in the sense that this is really the core and grounding of the conversations that we're having today. Um, so I uh, would just like to say that we are um, have the Q&A um, is a, a great way for you all to engage in our discussion today and I will be monitoring those and so um, if you do have follow up questions for some of the things that um, our justices are talking about today, please uh, feel free to stick those um, in and also if you would like um, to ask questions at the end, um, we can bring them in there. So I'll try to work them in um, as they seem appropriate in the conversation um, and, and get to them at the end if there's time. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you uh, so much for coming. Um, our discussion today is going to be really centered around practicing abolition um, in Native Nation courts today. And so we're interested in um, looking at how Native Nation courts are um, have long been thinking through um, issues that have become um, more popular recently um, through abolition movements um, and have been gaining speed and traction. And so um, basically, I'm just going to um, start by asking um, each of our uh, justices to um, introduce themselves um, and and then we will um, go in. So please, you know, I, I have a series of questions for um, our panelists today and um, we'll just um, ask folks uh, to, to go through them. So the first is to please introduce yourself um, and to share your path um, to becoming a judge. Um, so uh, let's see, um, um, Honorable Smith, would you begin please? Sure, my name is Cindy Smith. I'm a judge at the Suquamish, uh, the chief judge at the Suquamish Tribal Court. I also sit out at the whole court um, out on the coast and the Morongo Band of Mission Indians in Southern California. Um, quite honestly, my path to becoming a judge, I was a prosecutor and then I worked for EEOC. And then I became a mom and um, which was a great thing. And then a friend of mine actually from the prosecutor's office had this job and he was leaving and was looking to recommend someone for the job <clears throat> and he recommended me and that was over 20 years ago um so i mean it's pretty short and when you, i've learned a lot in those 20 years and we'll talk about that but essentially that's how i ended up being a tribal court judge awesome thank you all right uh Honorable Christine Williams, will you introduce yourself next, please? 
Thank you. Hi, I'm um, Christine Williams, and I'm a member of the Yurok tribe, which is located in Northern California. And um, I've been a tribal court judge for about 10 years, uh, graduated from law school 20 years ago. So not as experienced as um, the Honorable Judge Smith, who I know and, and um, really appreciate and as a colleague. Um, let's see, my path to the bench was similar to most in the sense that, you know, I graduated from college, went to law school, practiced for 10 years, and then was approached to um, take a job on the bench. But I think as a, as a native person, and also someone who was dedicated to practicing Indian law since graduation, and really focused on that in law school, in that um, the law school I attended Arizona State had an Indian law program. So um, really, my path to the bench started you know, probably a lot earlier maybe than some in the sense that um, my village uh, is not on federally recognized tribal land. Um, so the Yurok tribe has has land, but my village's site is not included in that. And my family's just struggled with protection of that village um, since, you know, the 1850s when things got really bad in California for Native people. And so... Um, we needed a lawyer, became a lawyer to try to help defend my own sacred sites and, and burial sites, and then moved on from there. And it was really just some tribe that I'd known and loved, asked if I wanted to be a judge, and I interviewed, and that was the start of it all. And um, I think for me, the part I really like is the the truth aspect. I mean, you know, a, a saying in my family was always the truth comes out. and um, you know, transparency is kind of key to the way I grew up. And so I really like trying to discover the truth and dealing with how complex that can really be. You know, you think there's one absolute truth until you get um, parties in front of you and you see the human side of things. And so as difficult as it is, I like I like that grapple to try to really bring out. Um, I think there's I think there's healing in truth. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Judge Strent, would you uh, please introduce yourself? All right. Hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is Meredith Strent. Uh, I am a friend and colleague of Professor Dennison's. We actually co-teach a class together at the University of Washington, but I am also the Chief Justice of the Osage Nation Supreme Court in Oklahoma. I'm also a member of the Osage Nation, and I am a uh, judge for the Northwest Intertribal Court System. I do both trial and appellate work, and I'm also an appellate judge for the Northern California Tribal Court Coalition, and uh, I do appellate work for that organization as well. So um, I've been a judge since 2006. Uh, I was appointed to the bench for my own nation when we reformed our government and adopted a constitution, our fourth constitution. And uh, I was approached by a principal chief to serve on the bench at the appellate level and I accepted. So that's been going on for 14 years. I've been chief justice for nine years now. So um, I've been doing this a while. And my story to the bench is pretty much like everyone else's. Uh, I was a practicing attorney. I went to law school actually with Judge Williams and I practiced Indian law and uh, I still do to this day, but my focus has been almost entirely on courts and justice issues uh, in the last, I would say 10 years or so. Um, I did actually serve two terms as an associate judge for the Puyallup Tribe of Indians in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and after I completed my two terms there, um, I have since just gone on to uh, take on other judging positions. Um, so anyway, yeah, my path to the bench was kind of like everyone else's. I was a practicing attorney and then I was approached to, uh, to sit on the bench. So, and it's been, um, it's been such a lovely journey. And uh, this is one of those positions where you are constantly learning things about yourself, about the law, about community. So yeah, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you all. And now I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the courts that you guys have worked with during your careers um, in terms of specifically if you've played any role in their development um, or sort of any history that you think would be useful to provide about them. Just, you know, offering everybody that's listening here some context and, you know, some, some of the variety that exists in some of these different courts would be um, really lovely. And some of the context that you're going to be speaking from with our, our questions today. So let's go ahead and start um, with Judge Williams on this question. Thank you. 
Well, um, that's a great segue to because I failed to mention the court I'm currently working for. So uh, I'm the chief judge for the Wilton Rancheria Tribal Court. And um, that court is a constitutionally created court in, and it's um, a three, it's four branch government system that they've created. So uh, they were terminated tribe in California and only recently re-recognized a few years ago. And they're, I am charged with setting up their court system, the entire justice system branch. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity for me, um, one that I take extremely seriously and really proud to be part of that. Um, because I love rules and forms and court structure, I think this is the most fun job I've ever had, not to mention um, working with the tribe that fought so long and so hard just to be acknowledged as existing in our um, constitutional you know, framework, if you will. Some think it's within the constitution, some don't. But um, regardless, the, the federal recognition system you know, failed them for so long. So maybe that's why they're one of the most appreciative people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, uh, or maybe they're just a positive group, I don't know. But uh, been, a, been a highlight of my career for sure. And um, I think some of my previous work with courts did prepare me to take on you know, a somewhat daunting task. Um, in California, we're a little late to be setting up courts, which can be seen as a negative thing, but you can also look at it as a positive thing. We can take from all the positive examples that are already out there. You know, um, as, as new as Osage's constitution might be, they've been around a while, so we can steal from them. You know, we can look at other tribes across the nation and see what's working and, um, and also find out what didn't work and just skip that. So that's been amazing. Um, something, I was the chief judge for the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indian Tribal Court for eight years. And I think something I'm most proud of there was we were able to start a joint jurisdiction court where because in uh, California, as in um, a few other states, we have public law 280 jurisdiction where we share concurrent jurisdiction over um, criminal and some civil matters. We were able to partner with um, El Dorado County to actually hear cases together where I, um, prior to retiring from that position, I sat next to a superior court judge, um, you know, once a week to once a month and actually heard cases, uh, most of them focusing on juvenile or family matters. And we were hopefully able to create better outcomes for our native, um, uh, Native people who are in the system. So that was really an exciting venture. And that court is still going, has a new judge now who I'll be swearing in actually later this week. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and then another kind of um, interesting project I got to work on was setting up an intertribal court in Northern California. Uh, the way a lot of tribes find themselves, and I'm sure it's not just in California, but uh, if the tribe doesn't have funds to sustain their court, and in California, we aren't eligible for some of the, um, the regular distributions that other uh, tribes across the nation get. And that's in part because of the public law 280 nature of our jurisdiction. Um, so the only funds that were really readily available and accessible were um, competitive grant funding. And so these tribes all contacted me around the same time wanting to set up a court. They were all neighbors in the same county and um, all of them wanted to apply for this competitive funding. And it just sort of became very real to me that, you know, we have literally cousins competing then against each other to try to get this limited funding that's project based three years, five years, and then you need to find other funds. So um, we started talking about getting together and sharing the administration of the court. And we sort of worked like a circuit court traveling from tribal location to tribal location using the laws of each tribe. Um, the only thing they really shared in common was the judge, the administrator, and all of the court processing, which all of you know is quite a bit of work. So um, so that's my experience working with uh, different tribal courts. Um, I just still feel like I have so much to learn, and, um, and I, I'm trying to look more into international models as I go forward, because I, I just think they're, it's a big, wide world, and somewhere someone's getting it right. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's really powerful work that you've been doing. Uh, Judge Smith, love to hear about some of the, the work that uh, you've done at particular courts and any roles that you've played in, in setting up those courts or the histories of them. 
Yeah, so um, at Suquamish, um, like many courts in the Northwest, I, um, the, you know, the BIA or, yeah, I think it was the BIA required that each tribe have a constitution. And so I think it was a boilerplate constitution with not very um, much input from the people, right? From the tribal folks, like what do they want their government to look like? And similarly, I think back, I think it was the eighties, maybe um, some uh, lawyer drafted a code for people, which was great because there weren't codes before that. And of course it was modeled after the state code. So in some ways it looks very Western, right? Um, and as time has gone by, um, I mean, the code development is kind of the last thing. It seems to be the last thing on everybody's plate. And of course, to me as a judge, it's the most critical because that's how I make my decisions. Um, <clears throat> but as time has gone by, there's definitely, you know, the courts, um, I've been really, really interested in how tribal courts started in the Northwest. I think it's fascinating. And what I've figured out so far, and it's all oral, kind of you have to talk to people. When I first started, there was these four or five native women who were running tribal courts and they were very scary women. It's like, I was like, well, whoa, okay, I'm gonna really behave. <clears throat> Subsequently, I've got to know them and they're fabulous. And unfortunately, some of them have passed on but I was struck by the fact that Native women took up the charge of establishing the courts. And in Suquamish, um, the first court was held in somebody's house. And there's really no resource for tribal courts or very little. And when I started at Suquamish, the court was in a trailer. Um, fortunately, we have a better facility, but it, uh, we've certainly outgrown that. And as time has gone by and more cases have been filed and things have gotten more complex, what I think is um, an incredible opportunity in tribal courts is it's a smaller government. So it's not like if you wanna change something, it's not like trying to change something in the county or the state. You pull together five people, sit around a table, come up with an idea, draft it, take it to tribal council, and it, they might approve it. Um, so that creates an immense amount of opportunity for change. Um, and in that, um, we were able to develop a healing to wellness court, um, change some of the court rules. Um, currently, so it, the tribal courts are in a constant state. Well, I feel, I don't know if you two would share this, in a constant state of development. Um, and so my current project that I'm interested in working on is improving the child welfare system. And like, uh, there are many frustrations, like Judge Williams said, the fact that there's competitive grants, that is a crazy idea. Like, how do you fund courts through competitive grants? That's a ridiculous project. And why isn't it just, um, okay, there's this many people across the nation, this many tribes, here's the pot of money, we divide it up in some proportion. Yeah, I know, right? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so there, there are many frustrations along the way and incredible opportunities. Um, so I, what I tell people is if you can dream it and figure it out and get the approval, you could probably do it. it that's not a simple project by any means because there can be many um, obstacles in the way, um, but that's certainly been my experience and one of the really there are many gratifying things about being a tribal court judge, many, many, um, but that is one of them. And the other, um, like what, another example of, well, this is an example, I don't know. Uh, out of Suquamish some years back, um, a civil protection order was entered um, in a domestic violence case that the federal district court threw out and created a hue and cry, at least to me and across the country. And, and again, we're a small government and we were able to really tell everybody across the nation, this is wrong. You know, domestic violence protection orders should be able to be upheld, tribal court protection orders. And through lots of meetings, you know, papers, um, testimony to different bodies, the federal law was changed so that tribal court orders are now recognized. That was very satisfying. I mean, it was an outrage what happened, but the fact that it could be changed that people listened and cared across the country and Congress changed the law 
was incredible. So those are the kinds of things that can happen in tribal court. Um, and it's an ongoing project and a lifetime and more, but incredibly meaningful and in being able to serve the community. Awesome, thank you for all your powerful work that you've been doing with these courts, Judge Smith. Judge Trent, love to hear about some of the courts that you've worked with and their histories and your involvement with them. Okay, well, um, I, I think the big one is the Osage Nation courts. Um, you know, like I said, this was our, our fourth constitution uh, that we adopted after sitting 400 years under a, a tribal council model that was forced on us back in 1906. So having the opportunity to work with our then chief justice at the time to figure out what kind of court system do we want to build has been, uh, was, was really educational for me. Um, our former chief justice who has since passed on, Charles Loja, he was extremely knowledgeable about courts and how they worked. And he was, um, you know, he was such a good mentor in terms of you know, letting us know about what his expectations were for concepts of justice and how things work, particularly in the Osage Nation. So, um, so when I was asked to take over in 2012 after his retirement, that was something that I really took to heart. And it was, it was important that we develop this court in a way that really reflects the values of the Osage. And so that's something that I've worked with our trial court judges and my, my associate Supreme Court justices on putting together a system that really does reflect Osage values. And that's just sort of part and parcel of the work that I do when I do tribal court development is that the courts should really reflect the community. So uh, there was a court I put together for a very small tribe in Southern California. And that one was, it was very specifically tailored to that community. They had very specific things they wanted it to address. And that's how we ended up building the court and um, and that one that was years in the making, um, at least I don't know, at least three or four years in the making. So um, so it took a lot of work and a lot of community meetings and a lot of meetings with stakeholders on what they wanted this court to be. And when you do that kind of development, that's really what you have to do is to be able to talk to the community and listen and make sure that what you put together is really a reflection of them. In the other courts that I've helped develop, um, I think that's been really key and identifying what the community's priorities are, what their values are, and making sure that they have confidence in the court that you build and that uh, they see this court as a resource, as a mechanism for resolution, for healing, um, as a way to keep the community together and to keep it healthy. So, um, so in the work that I've done in tribal court development has really been a product of that. Um, I always say that I try to do community engagement. I work on community-based programs. So anything that is really rooted in community values is really where I try to focus my efforts. So, um, so that's been kind of the work that I've been doing for different tribal courts, for different tribes. And I, it's been, it's like I said, it's incredibly rewarding. So I echo everything that, you know, Judge Williams and Judge Smith said that this is something that you just, you learn every day and you really learn about uh, the power and the resilience of the communities that we serve. And it's just, it's, you know, such an honor and a privilege to serve them. Awesome. Thank you for all your work that you've been doing, especially in the Osage, Judge Trent. It's very cool. Uh, so, we know that one of the fundamental aspects of ongoing colonialism is that it has disrupted native practices, right? Native ways of uh, creating justice and creating um, good societies, right? We know that this is a fundamental part of what has done. And I know that, you know, this has already sort of come up in some of you guys' answers of thinking about like, okay, so, so how do we do this work of how do we, you know, manage and navigate these kinds of colonial histories that have basically tried to force uh, Western laws um, and, and state practices and, you know, all of these kinds of things on these courts um, and navigate these sort of the things that are useful from those processes, you know, operate these things as um, we're still building them, while at the same time, and I think this is the piece I'd most love to hear from you all, while at the same time really trying to 
integrate native values um, into these courts like and so i'd love to hear just any reflections that you guys have seen you know maybe a particular case example or some general thoughts that you guys have about how you have seen native values be integrated into the native nation courts um, that you all are working with so i guess uh, we will go ahead and start with judge smith with this one okay <clears throat> yeah um that's a great question and uh, difficult and an ongoing process because what I feel is a major disconnect because you have this Western um, structure overlaid on a culture that's been there for thousands of years and it it doesn't always fit and it feels awkward and sometimes you know tribal members are in they, they feel it also it's like why why is it like this and of course I just walked into the structure and I didn't create the structure and um, I don't have particularly I mean you could go to the historical answers but I can't help in the specific case it's like well this is what it is this is what tribal council created and this is what we have having said that um, I think the experience of sitting in tribal court is very different than in state court um, the focus, at least in, in the Suquamish court, is definitely on um, uh, rehabilitation, sort of restorative justice, what that looks like. And so rather than, um, in, I, when I was a prosecutor, the, the saying was, you do the crime, you do the time. That's not the focus at all. The focus is, what can we do to help you become a healthy member of the society? And we use the court process, which sometimes is an effective tool, sometimes it's a very clumsy tool to achieve that goal. At the same time, you have to keep the community safe. And those are, um, at times, can be very difficult to balance and can, you know, community members can fall on either side of that and it can get a little heated. Um, but I think that is, uh, everybody knows that when they walk into the court, that's the value. What can we do to help you get back on track? Um, another thing that's very different is that um, I've seen many times, I'm sure the other judges have too, where family, they use that space to say things to their relative that they might be harder to say in other venues. For the relative who's in trouble, it's like, I care about you, I love you, I'm sad to see you this way, step it up you know, whatever they have to say, it, 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 to me, it creates a sacred space. In those moments, it is a sacred space for the family to do what, to say what they need to say to each other. You would never see that in the state court, um, rarely, if at all. And then um, currently, I think there's even a stronger move to, can we create, the question living now in Suquamish is, is can we create other, um, alternative ways to resolve disputes besides the traditional court process. I mean, there's the healing to wellness court, family treatment court, those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think I'm interested in, there's been talk of a peacemaking court, peacemaking circle or a restorative circle, any of those things, which I think would fit much better for many of the issues that come to tribal court. Um, it just sort of feels like basically, <laughs> You all need to go talk to each other. And can we do that in a way that keeps people safe and heard and productive? Um, and there are some great models out there for that. So we're doing the best we can with the structure we've got. That's what I would say to that. Awesome. Thank you for that. And, and actually, would you mind just talking briefly in this in the context of this for the healness to wellness cord and just what that looks like? Because I think a lot of our students in attendance might not sort of know what that involves. So just giving them a little bit of context for that, I think would be great. Right. So it's an indigenous model of the drug court. Um, and so it involves in, intensive services and supervision and weekly um, or frequent court hearings to monitor. Well, not only monitor, but to encourage people in their process, right? And so that starts out with the staffing before court, how's that going, what's the issues, what are, what happened for this person this during this time period? And then we go into court and it's, um, well, all the same parties are there, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the probation officer. It's, uh, if you could imagine, it's more surrounding this person with all of these uh, people who are cheering them on. And, you know, 
wow, you did great. You made it your meetings this week. That's awesome. Um, you know, maintain sobriety for 30 days. Fabulous. And then there's sort of incentives along the way, sanctions if you have a little slip up. Um, but it really is a model that supports people in their path to sobriety. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, let's hear from uh, Judge Strunt on this. I know this is something that you and I have actually written a little bit about, but love to hear your your thoughts on sort of how you've seen Native values be integrated into the courts. And I was gonna, uh, Judge, Judge Strunt had asked to go last every time, but I'm just not gonna let her. <laughs> okay, um, so I think this is one of the things that I found in doing this line of work is that uh, there's no one model for a tribal court. And, you know, when we talk about integrating community values, there is an element of the community just simply given the times that we live in where they want to see a judge on a bench and they want to see an attorney next to them and an attorney on the other side and they want to see these things. Um, and for them, that feels like it's very much a court system that, but that they can that they can have some space and that they can operate and function. It's not completely foreign to them the way a state court or a federal court might be. So, um, so I really wanted to to point that out is that um, to to the if you know to the extent that somebody says, well, the healing to wellness is a much more traditional model than the Western court. In a sense, it might be, but I think at the end of the day, it's really about incorporating values. And, you know, values themselves can be put into the model. So in terms of incorporating values, um, what we take a look at uh, are policy statements in the law or even, um, you know, historical documents. Um, sometimes we take a look at uh, traditional practices, particularly in communities where we're very well acquainted with either the people or with the culture itself. And, you know, working on a way to um, to reflect those values in the decisions you make. Um, so some of the things that we've noticed, you know, that a young man uh, may have trouble communicating uh, when he's by himself, but if you bring in, you know, you bring in his family members, he might actually open up and feel more comfortable communicating because he's got his family members with him. So, I mean, those are the types of small things that, that really make a difference. Um, sometimes it's a matter of, you know, getting off the bench. And I mean, I've gotten off the bench and sat down next to parents who had children in the system and, and just talked to them about their case. And for them, that was really important to them that they have that sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, even in a setting as formal as the court was in. So, it, I think it's it's really important to be able to read the room, to have your finger on the pulse of the community and really identify the things that people expect from their court. They expect judges to listen to them. They expect them to engage with them. Sometimes what we need to do is do a lot of active listening and to be able to reflect what they're saying back out. And sometimes it'll be in a way that the other party might actually understand. And they might, uh, instead of just completely shutting down and not listening, it might actually invite a dialogue between them. And you know, that's really some of the best results you can get is when you can maintain this dialogue between these parties who are disputing with each other and with the people who are helping them. Um, one of my biggest criticisms of the child welfare system and the criminal justice system um, is that I, I never did a jury trial. Every single criminal case that I've handled has been pled out and the plea has resulted in, here's a list of six things that you need to do and we'll check in on you in 90 days. And to me that for somebody who may have been battling addiction for 10 years, that's a very daunting task. And you know what you wanna be able to do is to give them the tools they need to succeed. And to do that, sometimes you need a healing to wellness model. You need to have them come back next week and check in and say, did you call? You know, did you set up a, a, you know, a counseling appointment? You know, that's literally all I want you to do when I come to see you next week. When you come back here, let's talk about that appointment. And it, it, it's really about incorporating those, those values in a way where people feel like that they are still a part of the community. Um, but at the same time, they're being held accountable for the actions that they took. And that's when we talk about like abolition and being, you know, non-incarceration type system, 
that's really what we want to be able to do is to provide a way for the community to feel that the offender is being treated and helped so that he can still, he or she can still be a part of the community. Awesome, thank you for that. I think it's really helpful to spell those things out really specifically and think about sort of what's at stake in them. Uh, Judge Williams, love to hear from you in terms of some of the values, native values that you've seen integrated into courts and how that how that works. And one thing I do wanna say is that when I'm saying native values, I mean very clearly the values that are specific to each native nation and not that there's some sort of universal or general um, native value set. So it's, it's more about like how local values are being incorporated into native nation courts is really the question. Thank you. And I appreciate that distinction. I think a lot of times the you know, no, no, I don't think any group of people really likes to be, um, you know, characterized as having some sort of pan culture with all of the, you know, various other people around them just because they're on the same continent. Um, so for me, um, I, I think this is the, what the kind of the key of what I do. Um, and yet it's a constant, constant struggle and probably one of the hardest things is to try to incorporate customs and traditions of each nation that I serve into the justice system that I'm either working for as a judge or helping to create in terms of consultation with, you know, the court documents and structural setup. Um, and so to, to really borrow a phrase from a friend of mine who just recently passed away from the COVID-19 um, virus quite tragically, um, but she used to always say, we're still repatriating our culture. Um, there has been a disruption for probably all Native nations. I'm now I'm stereotyping like I just said I wouldn't. But sadly, I think that's one of the things that unifies all of us as people is that we had cultural interruptions. They were deliberate and we're still healing from that. And so I just love that term repatriating our culture back into our justice system. Um, so I, I definitely see that in the course I serve. I'm um, really excited about Wilton Rancheria's um, tribal courts model in that in their um, foundational documents for the structure of their court, they incorporated a traditional court, which consists of a panel of elders. And for me as the chief judge, being a non-member there, it, it, would, it would be um, preposterous for me to put, you know, pretend to know the cultural norms of this tribe. I didn't grow up there. Um, I'm not an expert there. I'm not part of the community. I don't speak the language. And so for me to have a resource of, you know, this panel of elders who, quite the opposite, did grow up there, do, do you know, they do know the community really well. Um, it's, it's such a huge resource. And the way they've structured it is that for um, me as the chief judge, I can call upon the panel of elders either for advice on traditional customs um, and laws, basically, you know, so how, how were disputes settled um, traditionally? How, how would that look now? How does that look now? Um, and then additionally, I can refer matters to them sort of as a mediation panel. Um, really, they are just going to facilitate discussions with um, members of the public, tribal members, to see if they can reach resolution. Um, and if not, to at least make recommendations back to me as the judge about what they think should happen. Um, and I, I really like the sense that they're not judges in the sense. So they're really there to try to bring that healing, to try to bring resolution and to really look at, you know, these people are in the community and they're gonna be in the community tomorrow and the next day. And so how can we keep some sort of community respect amongst each other. How can, can and, and better, can we restore some of the respect? You know, everyone is going to be best friends. That's not realistic, but um, we have to coexist. And what does that look like? And how do we bring balance? So uh, I really love that model. Um, you know, we're still very new, so they haven't had any mediations yet, but we'll see. I will, I'll come back in a couple of years and keep you posted on how that goes. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's one of the things actually Judge Drent and I talk about this because um, for those of you considering to go to law school, if you're a student now, um, 
I have some of my best friends that I still talk to um, on a regular basis about professional matters and personal matters are the people I met in law school. So Judge Trent and I uh, have been friends since then. And I call her with frustrations around, you know, I've got these people who are professors, they're educated people, and they're well respected, and they are on the right side of the fight that we're in. And yet they say things like this tribal court is more traditional than that tribal court and um, look at what they're doing and uh, versus where, where this is a much more Western model. And I'm like, you don't understand that just that judgment alone is part of the problem. Tribes are sovereign and they're all um, different. And so what their cultural court might look like shouldn't, I don't think it's anybody's business from the outside to really judge that. Um, and it's been, you know, a long, long road to get to where we are and suffering under this colonization. And I think it's unreasonable to think that every tribal court is going to be decolonized at the same level. Um, and I don't even think everyone realizes every single thing. I mean, do you wear a black robe? Where is that from? I don't even think American judges should be wearing that. Didn't, didn't all the early settlers leave Europe because they didn't like the justice system there and they brought these robes with them, but they ditched the wig. I mean, it's just very arbitrary. Um, and then, you know, what, a, well, as I say, what about the structure of having a chief judge? I mean, did our tribes have a chief judge? I don't have any record of that. That wasn't how disputes were settled, but it certainly beats the alternative. So um, to me, I think if we don't continue to, to work on repatriating our culture back into our justice systems that reflect our worldviews, which Again, I can't find a lot of evidence that any tribe had any kind of incarceration um, as a system of um, justice. Then really just let's go to the state courts then if we're not going to distinguish ourselves culturally because it's, you know, at some point it's a lot of resources and a lot of time if we're just going to emulate state court model. Um, but again, it goes back to, but just by having your own tribal court, are you not exerting sovereignty? Are you not expressing a different worldview? So it's a it's a complex argument. I don't think there's simple answers. I love everyone's different models, but it really comes down to each community to kind of fight that struggle for themselves. So honored to have you know the colleagues that I can call up and say, I'm so frustrated with statements that are being made right now about this tribal court who, if they only knew what they've been through, they might feel differently about where they are now. Um, so I think that's, you know, part of it is just doing it, staying on the road and saying, I don't care what your outside judgments are, we're going to do this our way and struggle through the funding battles. And I'll tell you, Judge Smith, I have theories on why, but they're all a, a little bit maybe paranoid. So I won't go into them too much, but the funding system, from the BIA, from the Department of Justice, why is it pitting us all against each other in a competitive structure? Do I think that's accidental? Or do I think it's um, you know, furthering the termination strategy that was started all those years ago? Yeah, the latter, in the case everyone didn't guess. It wasn't the latter. I think it's that. I do. I think it's, I mean, whether it's conscious or not, I think that those systems aren't meant to propel us in having our own distinct courts because the grant funds also come with strings. They, you have to look a little Western or you can't have this funding. So I think it's strategic. I think it's, and I think it's fear-based. I think everyone's a little afraid of what tribes will do if they were just given complete sovereignty and, um, you know, supported funding. That's my, that's my bias. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I, you guys touched on so many really powerful points and I, I just especially like the nuance with which you guys are talking and telling these stories because I think, especially in scholarship, but I think in popular perceptions of natives, these complicated stories of how native nations are actually navigating ongoing colonialism and making these hard decisions and wanting to have separate space and then just trying to make the hard decisions about like, okay, we have the separate space. What do we take from these models? And, you know, I think it's, it's so key that different native nations are making very different kinds of decisions, but that they have to make sense for that community. And that that's, that's ultimately the, the biggest part of this 
rubric that they have to figure out is, you know, what what are the what are what is it that's going to make sense for us? What is it that our people are going to respond to? Right, going back to Judge Strent's comments about, you know, being community based, being really at the core of these things of understanding. And I really appreciate Judge Williams, um, your discussion of the. Um, Elders Council model of like you know having 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 a space to go to to get some some answers because you know obviously if every time you had to go to the community and ask uh, you know hold a community meeting and do these things that gets really hard so trying to find some shortcuts to some of this hard work I think is 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 really powerful um, I think you guys have done a really um, I think you guys have have touched on sort of in the more abstract this question of some of the differences between Native nations and other courts um, just in terms of some of these models of you know, really thinking about what does it mean to um, care for community members. And I think some of our follow up questions here when we start talking about um, incarceration versus other models, I think we'll touch on that further. So I think I'm going to go ahead and just ask you all to reflect on sort of how you see colonialism continuing. I think this is something you guys have also touched on, but I think it's it's worth spending a little bit more time on, you know, some of this you guys have already touched on and um, to, to really think about like where do we see colonialism continuing? How does it show up in our courts? I think the example that you just provided, um, Judge Williams is really powerful of like our funding mo models are, are very much colonized in these spaces, um, but also thinking about other, you know, some other aspects I'd love to hear from. So let's go ahead and uh, start with Judge Drent on this one. <laughs> okay, uh, so, you know, colonialism is actually reflected not just in the people who who interact, who view our court, like, you know, grant the, the federal programs that provide competitive grants to tribal courts, but it's also done in the community itself, where the community has, um, they're, because they're constantly immersed in Western culture, there are tons of things about them that end up being real products of colonialism. Um, the, I, I won't say that punishment, uh, sanctions in the form of incarceration is a product of colonialism, but I mean, I'll note that the whole reason why like the Federal Major Crimes Act was adopted was because of a murder that took place between two tribal members and it was, it was resolved by the families with no incarceration, um, it was just simply a matter of traditionally resolving the matter between the, you know, the murderer and the, the victim's families and the federal government didn't like that. So they said, okay, well, you know, you need to be subject to our court system and our rules and our universe. We don't like the way you did that. And I think that was really kind of the, and the, the case is, ex, um, is uh, oh my gosh, I just lost it. Ex parte crow dog. Ex parte yeah. crow dog. Thank you. I was about to say ex parte. I was about to say ex parte young for some reason. All right, ex parte my crow favorite dog. Favorite case. I have a favorite case. <laughs> I know it's your another. favorite case. So, um, and and so I think you know it's kind of birthed in in that notion where people say punishment is accountability, and to me those aren't the same things. Uh, punishment is not necessarily accountability. Punishment sometimes is just making the rest of the society feel good about dealing with somebody who wronged them. Um, but it doesn't exactly allow that person to come back into the community and be a productive part of it. And, you know, it's exactly like Judge Williams said, you know, the, the people who offend the community in some way, um, you know, they, they're going to be there the next day. They're going to be there when they, you know, when the, when the whole matter is over with, they're still going to be there. And, you know, how can the community continue to be whole? How can they continue to, um, to share the same communal experience and at the same time feel comforted that this individual who did some sort of wrong against us has has done exactly what they were supposed to do to to correct that wrong and a lot of that means making sure that they're in a position where they they won't do it again and that's that's where you talk about healing to wellness and restorative justice principles which by the way restorative justice principles have always been a function of you know making sure that offenders can be put back into the community and continue to be good productive members of the community and, you know, you hear about this in the state court system and in the juvenile court system. They talk about it like it's some novel concept that somebody just thought of in a study 
when in fact it's been put into place for such a long time by other communities. So this is just like one of my sticking points where it's like, this is not a new concept. This is not something that a professor invented or that somebody invented somewhere else. I mean, this was a practice that had been put into place that reflects certain values of making sure that people continue to have a space even after they've committed an offense against the community. Um, so uh, in terms of colonialism, what I see is people struggle with that. They struggle with, I want this person to be accountable and I want them to pay for what they did. But then at the same time, they're like, yeah, but I also want them to like, you know, come back and take care of their kids and take care of their parent who may be ailing. And, you know, we still want them to be part of the community. And so I think a lot of the effects of colonialism are to, you know, to help battle that and to help people kind of reconcile the need to punish and the need to, to, to bring closer and to, to, to envelop them again as part of the community. Awesome, thank you for that. I, especially adding in some of the history of these things, I think is, is, is really powerful. Um, yeah, so I'd love to hear, um, let's go ahead and go back to Judge Williams um, and hear, hear your thoughts on some of the ways that you see this play out. Well, I mean, it, I think it's a little bit everywhere. I mean, it's just, um, unfortunately, as Judge Trent alluded to, it's it's in every individual, in every community that I've ever served is um, colonialism is there. And I think, you know, you have to be really conscious about it. And even then, that doesn't just make it go away. So um, it's it's on an individual level, it's on a community level, and then it's on this like larger sort of um, justice reform um, in America level. Uh, and what, you know, and, and that's kind of an interesting thing that's happening too, is I, I look at American justice systems right now that are looking at themselves and saying, so this is really expensive and not working great. Um, the more people we incarcerate, the more people we have to incarcerate. So what is going wrong here? Um, is, is punitive um, incarceration really deterring crime the way we say it will. Uh, and, and so I think that's interesting because, you know, the quote colonists are starting to change their minds and um, adopt some of those, you know, new restorative practices that again have been in some of our communities forever. Um, and, you know, go ahead and call it new and take it and do it if it's going to be better. Uh, because I don't want things to just be better for native people. I want them to be better for everyone. Um, and that's, that's kind of, a native worldview, I think at least it is for my tribe. I mean, we're, um, we're world renewal people and we feel a responsibility to heal the world. So that's huge. Um, I think the best way to start with our own community and our own little part of the world, but uh, really it, if we're not modeling our best behavior for our other people, then we're not doing our best as Iraq citizens. So, um, in thinking of that every day, um, I, I think I think the punitive model of justice is is the most invasive thing I see in tribal justice systems. Um, to the point that I mean, I, when I was taking my first uh, first job as a chief judge, where it was really a lot of like setup and administration, and I went to the tribal chair of um, a tribe that I still hold very um, dear in my heart and said, so, you know, there's this grant funding and we could construct a, uh, a prison. And, you know, tribes, despite popular belief in California do have criminal jurisdiction. And, you know, we can incarcerate people if we choose to, meaning we, you. So do, do is that something your community would be interested in? Because at the time there was this funding grant for developing justice structures that was really for, in, prisons or detention centers only. Um, they've expanded that since then to be more about justice centers that could include wellness programs, but at the time that's what it was for. And um, the chairman said, you know, if you look at the statistics of who's incarcerated right now in the state of California and you see how overrepresented uh, the native population is, is they could have to say, I think California is doing a great job incarcerating natives. And we probably don't need to work on that. And I said, it works for me. Um, 
but yeah, I felt it was my responsibility to say there's this funding if you want to go for it. And I think, again, we're talk I'm talking about funding. I don't want to be a broken record, but if that's what the funding's for and, and that's how you get a building built on your reservation, it really drives a, a justice system to develop in a certain way. And so I think there's, a, again, a lot of courage to, to reject sort of the fear of like, but if that's the only funding we're going to get, then we need to apply for it because what are we going to do if we don't have a, a structure for our court? And so, you know, meaning a physical place and for this tribe to say, we've done fine without that funding and there's plenty of native people in jail already. Let's go ahead and focus on other things. Um, I thought it was really courageous. And that to me was a huge representation of a different worldview. I mean, a look at things as um, we're not afraid to handle those cases without having somewhere to lock people up. We think we can do this without it. And let's at least give it a shot because uh, we don't think that's working. So why would we emulate that? So I think, you know, to me, I do think um, incarceration and just punitive models and how that's supposed to function. It's, it's a it's somewhat foreign worldview for a lot of Native um cultures if you look at them traditionally, but where are we all now? I mean, all of us have been living in this society for so long and for a lot of Native people in California, the only justice system they've ever known is the state of California. And um, and so it's hard to get people to even come in and participate in wellness models sometimes because I think they are um, suffering from the trauma of their experience with the punitive model. And they don't really believe that being honest about their recovery is going to get them anywhere. Um, because previously it's just gotten them in more trouble. So a lot of work to sort of undo that trauma and work within models that are trauma informed and culturally informed. Um, but again, I think it's worth it. I mean, you know, one nice thing about working in small communities is the victories that are small mean a lot. They go a long way. And um, it's one of the things I love is you get to see, um, you know, reform family by family. And really has an impact. I really, I really appreciate that. And um, of course, the opposite is true. When it doesn't work, you feel that extra hard as well. So it's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy. But again, I think, you know, we've got to be done with easy. We've got to be done with fear. And we've got to take the courageous, harder road sometimes to get um, better outcomes. And I mean, when we talk about abolition, everyone stops saying, what about serial killers? Yes, I know. And what about Hitler? And what about, I get it. Um, some of us have actually thought this through all the way through and back around several, several times. And um, again, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to practice from, from fear um, that I think is being installed from an artificial system that doesn't represent how I feel about humans and, and the world. So I think, you know, that's what I'm trying to do one court at a time, one person at a time, one family at a time. But it's really not. I mean, there's a group of us. It's, I'm not alone. Um, and I know. It, I, I feel like state court judges are coming to me and, and to Meredith and to Cindy and saying, what are you doing that we could do better? And that's new and that's interesting and that's fantastic. So I really believe we're at a precipice here of some really great things, not just for tribes, but maybe for a lot of justice systems, at least maybe the one in America. Awesome. Uh, uh, Judge Smith, do you have uh, any additional thoughts that haven't been touched on in terms of thinking about how you see colonialism sort of popping its ugly head up? Um, I think we've touched on a lot of the good stuff, but I want to make sure to give you a chance in case there's additional thoughts you have. Um, yeah, thank you. Just a couple. Um, I, I, this is all so rich and um, and I know we're talking about colonialism, but I also want to step back and go just and the fact that tribal courts exist is huge. Doesn't mean they're not impacted by colonialism at every level, but the tribes have the sovereignty to have their own courts. And there's, uh, you know, it's an ongoing process of the relationship between the um, tribal courts and the rest of the system. But the that people are actually starting to understand that tribal courts exist and they have to work with us. That's huge. Um, that's been a ongoing, long and ongoing process. So I just, yes, it's been impacted by colonialism incredibly. And uh, the reason I'm saying this, I'm just finishing a decision where um, the jurisdiction of the tribal court's been challenged. 
in a fairly big case. And it's just like, but wait a minute, we exist and you made the deal. So you get to deal with us. And that's a powerful statement as opposed to going to the state. You actually have to deal with the tribal court. Um, yes, the tribal court has been in, incredibly impacted by, by colonialism. I think I already talked about that, the Western model overlaid and how awkward that is. And the only other thing I wanted to say is I, I loved what um, Meredith said that, you know, within tribal members, there's this conflict because, you know, I've had people pounding the table, throw the person in jail. They did something bad. We want, we want them out of here. They're, you know, running amok. They're creating havoc in our lives. And, um, you know, at the same time, a different family members would say, yes, and they need help. Um, and, and as the tribal court judge, you're sitting here juggling these things. I mean, it's incredibly difficult. And I wish there were a straightforward path. You know, I think the creation of that path has been interrupted by everything. By I mean, the cultural, the ability to create that path has been so interrupted by what has happened to Native people that people are truly just trying to find their way. And I think great progress is being made in that. And it's an exciting time um, to be in this field where people are going, wait a minute, you know, enough. We're going to find our own way. It was interrupted. We've lost many of our stories. We've lost many of our, our traditional knowledge, but we also are going to reclaim what we can and create what works for us. And that's very powerful. So that's all I have to say. Awesome, thank you. There's been some really great questions coming in through Q&A and I would save most of them um, toward the end, but there was one that I think is kind of clarifying that might be useful. And I'll just ask, you know, whoever whoever of you feels like you, you wanna answer this or can answer it quickly would be great. But um, there's some questions, a series of questions about sort of do native nations have to work with state courts? Do states have the power to incarcerate tribal members? Um, you know, so basically what the engagement, I mean, we know generally as a rule that with the, uh, um, with native nations, um, they're sovereign nations, that sovereignty is even recognized by the federal government in lots of powerful ways. And that the general rule of thumb is that native nations um, in their own jurisdiction with their own peoples are not subject um, to state law, but that they're subject to federal law. There's lots of exceptions to this. You guys are the lawyers um, and the judges. So I will let you sort of nuance this, but just wanting um, to give some, some basic answers for the folks on this call that have less context about sort of how native nations work and their relationship to states. Uh, somebody want to field that for me? I can field the Midwest portion oh, good. of it. Yeah, and then, Cal and then California can answer for California. Um, yeah. The answer to every single question is it depends, with the exception of Tom Slosher's question. Your question, you know the answer to that question. So, uh, but we'll talk about that. Um, but the answer is it depends to literally everything. And in cases where you don't have public law 280, uh, tribes have exclusive jurisdiction over you know their territory, and a person cannot be prosecuted under state law for a crime that was committed within the tribe's reservation. Um, depending on the nature of the crime, it can be prosecuted by the federal government. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, unless the person has violated state law and has been tried under state law, they cannot be incarcerated by the state government. Um, there are many exceptions to that, but that is the general, that's the general rule for non-public law 280 states. And uh, with respect to having to work with the state court, no, tribes absolutely do not have to work with state courts, but when you deal with cross-jurisdictional issues, particularly um, in cases where you've got, you know, you've got a set of spouses and one spouse rents to state court to get a divorce and the other spouse rents to tribal court to get a divorce, um, then we have a dilemma. What do we do? We've got two people in two different courts, both with an equal claim to get whatever sort of dissolution they need or some sort of relief they need. And, you know, how do we sort that out? And what we found has been our most important tool has been communication and collaboration. So while it is not necessary to work with state court judges, it is a necessary reality of the work that we do. And we find that we have much better results when we communicate and when we collaborate with our colleagues. And that is really a part of the struggle that we deal with, which is less so now than it was about 20 years ago, but being seen as colleagues um, being seen as judges. There were times when I feel like a little kid with pigtails going, I'm a real judge. 
And, you know, I, I do that a lot less now than I did like 15 years ago, uh, where you actually walk into a room and it's like, oh, it's Judge Dredd, it's Judge Williams, it's Judge Smith. And, you know, being seen as a colleague is, um, is a really important part of that relationship. We're very fortunate in Washington to have the relationship that we do with the state. Um, it is not that way everywhere, uh, which is one of the reasons why I live here. So uh, that's kind of the short answer I can give for that part of it, for the non-PL280 part. I'll jump in on the PL280 part. Um, so that's Public Law 280 is a, is a federal law and it does dictate a different jurisdictional structure from the federal government around, um, as I alluded to earlier, criminal jurisdiction primarily and then some civil jurisdiction. And California was one of the mandatory states initially um, and, and there is a provision to retrocede from this law, but I don't, I think only um, certain tribes within certain states have done that. And in California, I don't think anyone has. So um, it, what it basically says is that uh, it kind of erases that federal boundary line within Indian country in California and says that the state has full criminal jurisdiction in Indian country over native people and non-native people but that it's shared concurrently with tribes. And no one knows what that means. Um, how can you share concurrent jurisdiction and what, what does that look like? And so, um, again, I think the question itself and the framing of it presumes a colonial model, honestly, in that do tribes have to work with states? So, you know, the answer really, and I, I hate to get too like, you know, woo woo on everybody, but. Nobody has to do anything. If you're willing to accept the outcomes of your actions, you can do whatever you want. And so I think when, when you ask that question and you're looking at, um, and I can't speak to Wilton because I don't know their customs and traditions well enough yet, but as a Yurok tribal member, I can say, I think the Yurok tribal court has to because we as Yurok people, like I said, we're world renewal people. And so how can we say that we're going to ignore our state partners and ignore the people participating in those justice systems, um, some of which are our tribal members, uh, and just let that system, you know, not be the best it can be without any regard. It's not the way we look at life. So in that sense, you know, from the Europe perspective, yeah, we do have to, but not because the federal government says we have to, and not because the state government says we have to, because it fits within our worldview of um, doing right by people and our, you know, I think a lot of uh, our tribal customs are about sort of justice. In fact, I think really the laws you adopt, the, the social constructs, the, the um, you know, interpersonal policies people share amongst each other, those are a reflection of your community and what you value and how you approach uh, rights and wrongs. And so to me, you know, it's a, it's, I agree with Meredith, it depends. It depends on each tribe and what they feel they need to do. Um, but there's also some practical realities. If you want, and Judge Smith talked about this, if you want a restraining order to be valid on and off the reservation, which, you know, travel on and off the reservation is so fluid, at least in California, people don't, it's not a, you know, little prison. They should be able to leave the reservation and still feel that their restraining order is as effective as it is when they're home. And so for that, there's, you know, that partnership is a real safety measure that it's hard to overlook because you want to be sovereign and you don't want to work with these state systems that don't represent your worldviews. So, so that's the complicated answer is, you know, I always try to do it. I think it's best practice and I think it um, gives an opportunity for state systems to look at our models and, and hopefully take away something positive and probably provides better protections for all of our tribal people. Awesome. Thank you for that. And I especially appreciate this idea of like, you know, the goal is, 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 is to make all of these systems better, right? Like, I just think that is such an important thing to lose sight of that sovereignty is really key and really important, but it turns out we live in the middle of, or in the context of the USA, we're in the middle in the California, less middle, but you know, <laughs> conceptually middle of the belly of the beast in, in terms of all this stuff and have to navigate these things in a larger scheme. And that that's, that's just part of the work that has to be done by our native nation leaders, such as our, our judges. 
Um, just real quick, um, my understanding of there's a clarifying question about when 280 law applies. And basically it was like there were certain states that in the 19, what, 1953, when this came about, that it applied to in certain states it didn't, right? That's pretty the simple answer to that. Okay. Yeah, that's yep. correct, yeah. Awesome. So now I want to ask you all sort of the, the heart of the question that we really wanted to, you guys have been touching on it this whole time, but just really want to um, focus specifically on this issue of incarceration and just asking you all, have the courts that you guys worked with, have you guys used incarceration as one of the options? What alternatives to incarceration? You guys have touched on a couple of these, but any other things that you um, have to say about alternatives to incarceration? But specifically, we're really interested in you know, how do you measure whether these alternatives to incarceration are working or whether incarceration for that matter is working? Like what are the, what are the tools by which these things can get measured? I think is, 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 is maybe the thrust of where we could go with this that we haven't yet touched on. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and uh, start with uh, Judge Smith on this one. Well, and this is kind of the heart of the issue, right? That we've been talking about, like how do you uh, deal with people who've misbehaved? And I would, I mean, yes, we do use incarceration. Um, with the focus, I do want to reiterate of um, restoration, you know, how can rehabilitation, how can we help to make you whole? And um, to the sort of serial killer and Hitler and all that, I mean, there's a couple of folks that are a danger. I would say, you know, 98, 99% of people don't fall in that category. There are a few folks who really uh, imperil people's safety. And I don't have any other tool. If I had another tool, I might use it, but the only tool I have is incarceration. And um, so, yeah, and in those instances, people are incarcerated. And then there's also the process of, okay, and is there anything we can do to fix, to help this person get better? Um, yeah, a couple of cases that I have right now, I really don't know the answer to that. Most of the time, the answer is yes. A couple of these, like, mm, I really don't know. Stay tuned. Um, you know, I think the alternatives are many. Um, we've kind of, because of COVID, everything got pretty much shut down, but um, community service, you know, I, I love the idea of, um, I'd like to set up kind of a, some sort of diversion or elders panel. It's like, okay, you got in trouble, like the traditional court that uh, Judge Williams has or something, you got in trouble. I'd like to set up an elders panel and support that because one time we just threw somebody over there said, go have lunch with the elders. And they went, well, what do we do with this person? So actually put some structure with that, you know, what the community wants. And that would be a great alternative, um, you know, learning about the culture, learning your family history, uh, all sorts of ways to engage people and help people engage in their life. None of, the only one that we've implemented really is community service as an alternative. Um, oh, apology letters, apologizing to the elders. We've done those kinds of things. Um, sorry, I forgot the rest of the question. Oh, measurement. No, we don't. Um, oh, I had a couple of, we, we had, there is really no measurement. I will say this is really interesting. When people are in the depths of their addiction and they go, okay, um, I'm quite honestly concerned for their life and not that they're not drugs in jail. I'm not naive enough to think that, but I think there's a better chance that until they get into treatment, they won't use drugs in jail or will use them less. And so often um, people, that is the first stop. Wow, we get the bed aid arranged and get them shipped off to inpatient treatment. And quite honestly, this sounds so weird, but I have had, you know, many people come back and say, thank you for sending me to jail, which kind of makes me want to cry in all kinds of ways. You know, it's sad that I had to do that. It's, I'm so thankful and grateful that you are here, you know, you obtained your sobriety. I'm, you're back with us, you know, it's like you're back in the community. It's just a very confusing um, situation. So yeah, I mean, and I, I come to, again, the tools that the court has to utilize in these situations are blunt tools. And sometimes you actually need a very fine instrument and the court as, it, as it's structured in Suquamish is not that. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing those perspectives with us. Uh, let's go ahead and go to uh, Judge Williams and your your take on this and incarceration as a model and you know how you sort of go about measuring it or alternatives to it in terms of effectiveness. Thank you. So in California, like I said, all the courts I've worked for, we have not utilized incarceration um, for any of the tribal court work we've done. Um, we did at Shingle Springs um, when we partnered with the state to do our joint jurisdiction court. Uh, part of that was that when the state um, codes, whether it was the child welfare code or the criminal code, mandated um, a minimum sentence time for certain violations, we did have to respect that. And so that was the first time I had ever signed an order committing um, a minor to a detention facility. Um, and it was a tough day for me. I had to walk off the bench. And you know, the state court judge said, you don't have to do this. You can just, I'll just sign it and you can abstain. And I said, no, we want to partner with you and we want to be in the system with you. And that means I'm going to do this hard thing today because, um, you know, that's, that's what I could pay to do is make the hard decisions and do the hard work. So, you know, I'm, I, I, while it wasn't a pleasant thing, we, that was an instance where you know, I, my name is on an order committing um, someone to uh, a, a time of detention. Uh, and then I did it again in a criminal case for an adult in the same joint jurisdiction court, because again, that was what was required under the state law. And we were doing this concurrently respecting both systems. So hopefully that will have the big long-term impact. We're hoping it will. I think that it will, but um, you know, that's another judge's problem now, although we'll probably be doing something similar to that at Wilson in um, short measure here. Um, in terms of, you know, what are the alternatives we look to? It's a lot of really intense um, services. I think that, you know, people need to start reframing what is um, public safety. I mean, I, I think Judge Smith really talked about this. It's not easy to just say, we're gonna walk away from incarceration completely because we in America have created um, public safety is synonymous with the criminal justice system and incarceration and punitive models. And so how do we just abandon that overnight? I don't think it can be done overnight. I think it's gonna be a long undoing, um, but there are practices that we can start looking to. And some of that is to change the way we think about drug and alcohol abuse, which is a huge part of our incarcerated population in America um, and start treating that like a health crisis. And I don't even want to put in the word mental health crisis. I just want it to be considered a health crisis to where we have something from the emergency level all the way through the long-term treatment model that serves people better and does provide for those um, alternatives. And I think the tribes I'm working with are better at that. They just are able to say, you know, we, we've got to, what can we do? What services can we provide to get around this person and, and encircle them with a system of care? And, um, and then, you know, they do need to be accountable and try to restore the imbalance they created. But what does that really look like from behind bars? They're more, they're more useful to us here in the community. I had an elder also say to me, um, you know, people go away to state prison through the state system. It's like, but you know where they come back? Here. They come back here. So can you judge, can you keep them from going? Because they usually come back worse. And we aren't going to turn them away. But it'd be great if they didn't have to go and get further traumatized. And then we have more work to try to heal around. So I think that's sort of it. It's just keeping people in their communities, keeping them connected, um, and trying to help them reintegrate into the cultural systems. But again, as a judge, it's really not my job to sentence someone to culture. That becomes real tricky. You know, you're going to learn your language. Uh, you're going to go to the dances. I mean, I think the dance people were like, oh, no, you're not. Um, there's no, you know, we don't have room for that sort of unseen space right now. Like this is a, a holy thing where we're connecting with either our ancestors or our higher power. And we can't have someone who's drug addicted there. So people always talk about like, you know, culture, put culture in. I'm like, well, what does that look like though? I mean, it's not, it's easy to say, how do you actually do it? Um, so I get to go to the elders and say, figure it out. 
Um, and they're smarter than me, so that's great. But really, it's it's complex. This is really, uh, you know, I when I say get rid of all the prison, I'm not just saying that flippantly. I know that this is a process and that there's a lot we need to consider to do this. Um, and I don't want to just make mental health institutions that are substitute prisons. That's not the answer either. Um, although things did really take a bad turn when we got rid of those in California, but we'll, we won't revisit the 80s. Anyway, um, although well, the 80s were great in a lot of ways. I had big hair. I, and so the point is, though, we, it's not easy. I'm not saying there's easy solutions, but, but you, you do have to start being creative. And that's where I think the fear part comes in. When someone's doing something new, you don't know if it's going to work. And it is hard to measure, to your question, um, Professor Dennison. Um, the measurements are so small. They're like at a micro level where we had a family that had three generations of chronic truancy. And chronic truancy is one of the leading factors of adult incarceration. And so we, through a kind of um, this joint jurisdiction wellness court, which dealt with truancy issues, uh, we got that family going in the other direction where all the kids were attending school. They started doing well in school. And we broke this you know, three generation cycle of chronic truancy. Um, I feel like in the grand scheme, people don't necessarily care about that story. But I'll tell you what, the county education board representative cared a lot. She felt like that was a huge, huge piece of data that showed um, a marked turn in um, and a pattern. And if we can do it for one family, we can do it for more families. So, but again, it's just, it's, it's hard when we're all relatively small communities compared to the larger criminal justice system to say this anecdotal story about this one family matters, but it sure did matter to us. I think it mattered to the kids who were going to school and felt like they could achieve and um, access higher education as colonialized as it all may be. Uh, it's still a pathway to success and away from prison. So, so I don't have all the answers. I don't think any of us do. And it's, you know, it's certainly not for me to judge any other systems that do utilize incarceration because there are some real challenges to not having that as a tool. Oh, thank you so much for that really powerful words and a really great discussion of how you're approaching these things. Judge Strand, what about your contacts and thinking through incarceration and what you think, uh, you know, how do you measure these things about whether they're effective or not? Well, and it's, it's like Judge Williams said, it's, you know, it's small, important things. It's small, important results that really add up. Um, one of the things that I always kept track of when I ran the criminal docket was, you know, how often I see someone. So, um, you know, if I went, you know, a year, if I went, if I went 30 days without seeing someone, I felt like that that was a good day. And uh, when they would come in to report on how their probation was going, that was a good day. That was a win. So sometimes it's, you know, um, I give them one thing to do and then I talk to them in two weeks and they did that thing. That's huge. Maybe that's more than they've ever done um, over the last five or six years. So some of it's changing how you measure things uh, by saying, oh, they're never in jail again or they never appear in the criminal justice system again. Um, you know, sometimes it's not always the best measure, but did they go back to school? Did they start paying their child support? Um, you know, have they gotten a job? Um, you know, recidivism is one thing, but also taking a look at how they've become part of the community again. Uh, have they started participating in events again? Um, I, I mean, those are the types of small community measures that I see where someone said, oh, I saw so-and-so at the fireworks stand and, you know, they were helping out their uncle and they looked really good. And I'm like, oh, that's a win. You know, that's something that they didn't do a year ago. Uh, so that's the type of stuff that I, I take a look at. What are these small steps? What are these small victories that may seem kind of minuscule and often which sometimes, and sometimes it's the, the mindset of the prosecutors uh, where they come in and they say, well, they did this one thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's amazing. They did one thing. I think you need to figure out where you want to set your bar. And sometimes that colonial mindset is very much present um, especially when you get like career prosecutors who come in after 20 years of being in, 
you know, uh, Pierce County or Thurston County or wherever, and they come in after 20 years of it. And, you know, they have this very different mindset. And some of it's like, no, we're changing where we set the bar. We set the bar with, they did eight hours of community service. We set the bar with, they're taking their GED course right now. Um, those are the types of things that you want to be able to identify and measure. And sometimes, you know, when you have a, a defendant who's who's particularly in the throes of addiction and they come to a, you know, probation hearing and you just say, how are you doing? And they said, your honor, I had a really good week and I got, you know, I was clean. I got a full night of sleep. I'm working. I mean, sometimes just to hear from them that they have had a good week that's a huge milestone. And those are the things that really kind of uh, we as judges appreciate. We're like, okay, what? here's a victory. Thank goodness. Something's working. And, you know, it's it really is like we don't have the answers. And sometimes we're just trying. We Sometimes it's conversations we have with the defendants. If I were to tell you to do this, do you think you'd do it? And, you know, I was luckily with some defendants who were very forthright, like, no, that sounds stupid. I'm like, okay. Um, what do you think you can do? If I see you in two weeks, tell me what you're going to do. And they're like, oh, I'll check in with my probation officer and I'll go get a drug and alcohol evaluation. I'm like, good, don't do those things. Um, and again, it's it's communication. And sometimes it is collaboration. You are sort of collaborating with the party in front of you and, and saying, you know, let's take a look at where you're at mentally, where you're at physically. Um, when people return from incarceration, the challenges that I found were they couldn't get housing, they couldn't get a job. They, you know, they were behind on child support payments. I, I mean, it's just, you know, when you go into incarceration, the world keeps turning, child support payments stack up. You might get evicted while you're like, some people just, they went straight from arrest to jail. And like, what happens to their apartment? Like, <laughs> where did they live? And, you know, and some of it's lining up resources afterwards and making sure that there is a place for them back in the community. And I think those are really steps that a lot of tribes have started to take when they talk about bringing people back from incarceration, um, making sure that they have resources at their disposal, making sure that they still have access to, to therapy, to counseling, to housing, to even employment. Um, and I mean, sometimes that's the best we can do is when the system puts someone in jail is to, to have a place for them to come back to. Um, and that's part of the challenge too. But it's kind of like what Judge Williams said, you know, maybe let's not make that the first thing we do. You know, let's, let's not make sending them to jail the first thing that has to be done, unless we talk about an issue of actual safety for the community. So that's kind of where my thoughts are. Awesome. Thank you all. This has been such a rich and really powerful conversation. And I wish we had um, had a little bit more time for some of these amazing questions. I think I, there's a couple of ones that I think I can combine just real quickly. If you guys will stick with me just a couple more minutes to answer them, I think it'd be really powerful. Um, just trying to think about like, what is it that can be learned from the context of Native nations that could be taken? Not, you know, I mean, somebody asked about state courts specifically, but I think uh, another question that is interesting is just like, how do we how do we do this kind of work in our communities without the state, right? Like, is, are there lessons from this that we can take to think about, um, you know, the larger lessons that that we can do in terms of caring for each other in this kind of abolitionist sense? And I, I'm just open it up to any of you all that want to reflect or talk on that. I'll kick it off and just say my my hope for everyone is that we start thinking more about strength-based modeling and get a little bit away from deficit-based, which again is another sort of system of the way you write grants. First, you write your problem statement. Okay, so I'll just tell you, grant provider, all the problems that my community has. Um, I, I hate all of that. I, I like to see everyone, um, you know, go to your community and look to what your strengths are. I mean, Judge Trent was talking about doing that at a, at a micro level in the courtroom. Um, are you gonna go to these six classes this week? No, they're stupid. All right, so what is gonna work? You know, what are your strengths and what can we start with? Because as you build on strengths, um, you, you can build on those some more. And, you, and this foundation starts to, you know, firm up underneath people's feet and they feel more confident in who they are and where they are. And you know, 
it starts with sort of believing that your community has something to offer. Each person in your community has something to offer and um, that there just, you know, isn't this sort of worthless group of people that you get to just sort of discard on some proverbial island somewhere. So when you think about that and you think about the strengths and you look inward and say, what are we great at? Um, you can build on those and, um, you know, and, and it's, it really starts from there. And I think that also creates sustainable systems because just going, you know, healing to wellness, that's the big hot buzzword and it's so great. But what if you don't have the resources to support a quote healing to wellness course? What, you know, it takes a lot of intensive resources to do that. So sustainability, I think, is, is something we need to be mindful of because telling the community you're going to do something and then not doing it is another betrayal. Having that come from your own justice system, it's hard to recover from that. So I think just, you know, looking at strengths, being realistic and starting where you can is, is, is huge. And then, you know, again, trying to move through your, the fear of what might go wrong because something really might. Um, and not to say don't be afraid, but just don't operate from a fear-based model or a deficit-based model. That would be my, my recommendation. Love it. I, I really think that that is so much the core of so much of the work that needs to happen in and outside the academy is getting away, especially in the context of indigenous nations, is getting away from our de deficit-based models and instead looking at like, what do we have to offer to support each other, right? And looking at our desires and, and, and what we can actually do to support each other. That's really powerful. Thank you. Any other responses to that or other closing comments uh, from our other, from Judge Drent or Judge Smith? I kind of want to follow up with that because um, <clears throat> I think it's so important to hold the, like the worthless group of people living on the island. And there is that, there can be that sense, but I think it's imperative to hold a vision of who that person is in their being that person probably can't hold that picture themselves because of things that have happened to them. And, um, you know, the, the whole trauma piece is huge because you, you go, well, why'd you do that? You know, and you get frustrated. Everybody gets frustrated with their relative who's run amok. But rather than that, you say, what happened to you? And I often have that in the back of my mind. Okay, I don't know what happened to this person that resulted in this, but I see I am going to hold this picture of who this person is, the strength of this person, the strength of the family around him, the strengths of the or her and the community. And then how do we move forward from there? Um, I certainly try to approach the cases that way. Um, you know, it's a tall order, but um, and you know, sometimes people have never had anybody hold up that picture for them. And then that gives them a little bit of a toehold. And then um, I think it was Meredith said, you know, when they start to get a little toehold and then another one, and pretty soon they got five toeholds and then they're starting to build that foundation. And once that happens, you know, I've seen people transform. And the only other one thing I want to say, we're talking about all the anecdotal evidence. So I'm part of this uh, gender study in Washington state. And I said, well, there's all this anecdotal evidence, but you know, it's not like data. And uh, one of the researchers says, well, that's evidence from the field. And so there's lots of evidence from the field, myriad and myriad of stories. And that's how people, you know, I mean, I can't, I have observed that that's how things work in tribal communities. It's the stories and the stories are really important. And what happened for that one family in California is huge. And, you know, that's massive evidence from the field that I want to say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Judge Drent, you want final words? Yeah. I, uh, so I wanted to point something out when we talk about incarceration, that there is, whether or not we we believe it or have that in our head or are aware of it, but there's a stigma that becomes attached to it. Even uh, so, this is <laughs> this is one of my stories from back home in Oklahoma. Um, anybody who gets picked up in Osage County, their booking photos get posted on the Osage County Jail website, and that becomes that is gossip fodder. I mean, this is what people do every morning. They wake up, they drink their coffee, they smoke their cigarettes, and then they take a look at who got picked up. And, you know, then I'll get random texts. So-and-so got picked up last night, you know, oh, well, you know, this person got released. Did you hear that so-and-so was arrested? And, and you know, it, it becomes gossip fodder for the community. And, you know, so it's sort of like from that point on, 
that's what people are going to say. That's what they're going to note. And, um, and that's why I think when you talk about incarceration in small communities, there's, there's something that gets attached to that. And whether or not we're really consciously aware of it, um, it, can, it can alter how that person interacts with the rest of their community. And they can either just kind of act like it never happened, they can be embarrassed by it, or they can be, you know, be like, yeah, that was me. And a little too much the other night and I got picked up. Um, but what you wanna be able to do is to still have that space for them in the community. Um, but to do something like this, to get the booking photos and to see it, I mean, it, it is, it's gossip fodder every single morning. This is what people do. Um, I, I think it can, I think it does damage. And I think that it, it does create this stigma in the community that this person um, may have done something wrong. And they don't see it as may have done something. They see it as they did something. And that really starts to undermine the work that we do in terms of our justice system. Um, arrest doesn't equal guilt. And, um, but when you see those photos, you see those booking photos, you know, that, that wheel starts to turn. And that starts, you know, this whole question of, does this person really belong here? Does this person really, is this the kind of person that I want to be around or I want to be related to? I want my kids around, whatever it might be. And, and so I think that's just another one of those dangers of incarceration um, that it presumes, it starts to plant this idea that someone is presumed to have committed a crime because they got picked up by the police and they got booked into jail. And I just find that so, I can find that very damaging, particularly when, you know, I go into court and I go on the bench and people come in with just these preconceived notions of something that happened and that becomes the truth. And that's really kind of tying back to what Judge Williams said at the very beginning is, you know, um, finding where the truth is and being able to connect these two sort of, uh, these two different thoughts that may exist in a dichotomy in a way uh, one of the things that I have learned as a judge is to never use the word but uh, when connecting two sentences that seem unrelated, but to say and, because basically when we deal with trying to find truths in court, um, you're dealing with different statements. And so these statements have to exist in the same space. So instead of saying this person was picked up, but this, it's like this person was picked up and this, and it kind of changes how you examine the issue. Uh, and that's just, you know, it's just one of the, the tools and the, the techniques that we pick up as we work with these communities and giving them a space to come back to them and giving them a space to be. Awesome. Well, thank you all. And thank you to everyone who has stuck with us uh, through this uh, conversation. It's, it was, a, you know, we know it's hard to be on Zoom for this long period of time, but just really appreciated being able to hear the in-depth stories and ideas and experiences you guys have all shared with us. They've been exceptionally powerful and provide so much insight and nuance into this really complicated topic that I think far too often gets idolized, right? Something like abolition, people think of it in the abstract, they, people think of it in its ideal forms. And, you know, I just really, I think the Native Nation context provides such a really powerful nuancing and talking about what does this look like in practice and, and what, what are the pieces that have to be in place? And, you know, how does this fit into larger systems of justice, both in Native Nation contexts and in others? And so just appreciate all the really powerful wisdom that you guys have shared with us today. Um, I know that uh, Meredith has, uh, that Meredith and I have a, a gift that we would like to offer to um, both of our judges for uh, thanking you all for that today. Um, so, I, Meredith, do you want to just briefly mention that? Yes, um, we do have a couple of gifts for you. They will be forthcoming in the mail, so I'll probably just reach out and make sure that I get it to the right place. Um, but they are just a couple of new pieces that the eighth generation has um, has just made available to the public. So uh, I hope that you know that you enjoy them, and we just appreciate you taking your time to do this. Appreciate it Thank so you much. So Thank much. You. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That's very unexpected. It was my yeah, honor very, to be here. And great yes, to see all of you. Much. Yeah, very nice. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, really appreciate uh, everybody's time today. Thank you so much. Thank you.